You are watching Life on Gabriela TV, community television for you, by you. Okay, hello everybody. <sighs> My father, George Georgiev, or Georgi, as some of you might know him as, has been here since 1986 on Gabriola. Most of his inventions have been created on this island and are world-renowned. So I just want to thank you all for coming and listening today and to the museum for inviting us to do this talk. It's been a long time and it's so wonderful that uh, this knowledge is going to get shared. And I hope that uh, you all feel proud of the work that he's done and that has been created here in Canada on our little beautiful, innovative, creative island. I have prepared pictures and write-ups of his career all the way back from his time in Toronto through to present time. If so if you want to take a few moments at the end to have a gander, uh, we'll be here to answer any questions or to kind of dive in more into what he has created. Obviously, we have the speed bikes here, which afterwards, if you would like, some people are welcome to try to sit in it. <laughs> See how fast you can go. Um, and his current models of his tricycles, which I'm sure you see riding around the island often. So let's give it up for my father, George Georgiev. <laughs> Papa, make your way to the stage. We are also lucky enough to have two guest speakers along with my, with my father. One is here, Daniel Wesley, come up onto the stage. Let's give it up for Daniel Wesley. And the fastest man on earth, here we go, Sam Whittingham, come on up. And before they take it away, let's give it up for my brother, Stefan Georgiev in the back who helped set this all up. Hello? Yeah. Do you hear me? Yeah. Welcome, my dear Gabriola people. You know, let's talk a little bit about what had happened in the last 40 years here with me, my family, and my riders, Sam Whittingham and Daniel West. This man here have more gold medals for Canada than any other a paraplegic person. He's not paraplegic, he's uh, <laughs> amputee. So he's an Olympian. <laughs> and, and this man here has broke all the records that one can break on human power alone, on human power alone, just pedaling with now any assist. He, he was the first one to go over 70 miles an hour, the first one to go over 75, the first one to go over 80, and the final result was 83 miles an hour, which is, which is a speed danger with one of these things here on the very flat area, long about 10 miles, you start from the 10th mile and end up measured in the last 200 meters. And 200 meters he was passing of over 83, 84 mile an hour. Uh, you can see it all on the YouTube, it's all posted there. So he's my hero. <laughs> and uh, he'd been riding my cycles and that's why we call them <laughs> Sam Stefan, Sam Stefan, Sam my little daughter, my daughter said, they are Samsicles. <laughs> so, they're all Samsicles. And this particular one there, nobody have raised it yet. It is a novelty with, uh, with electronics and you don't have a window on it. As you see, there is no window, but inside you have a screen and you have through the video, you see what's going outside. 
the last year, uh, two, two, three years ago, was the first thing written, but no success so far. Mm -hmm. Anyway, this is the fastest cycle. With, with window, there are other cycles that go a little bit faster, which do not have windows. <laughs> cycles with no windows go faster because the window takes a lot of, uh, has a lot of resistance. And because we use only half a horsepower to three quarter horsepower to go 80, 85 miles an hour with that amount of energy, that means the vehicle has to be super efficient, have to slip through the air without air knowing that something is passing through. <laughs> <laughs> That's very important. And I succeeded by chance. I didn't know because I'm not an engineer, I'm not aerodynamist. And I did, but I was making these little things as a child in Bulgaria, and creating little airplanes and all sorts of aerodynamic uh, objects. And I used to fly them with the ropes and other things, and trying to see. And when I came to Canada, first thing I went to Canada Tower. I said, "They have all the tools here, so I can do something." <laughs> so that's how I started. Uh, many, many years ago, in 1972, when I arrived in this country, from a city called Varna, on the Black Sea coast. It's a resort town. Some people say it's very beautiful. And uh, um, that's, I ended up here. I ended up here because I really had, from 1930s, relatives from Bulgaria, relatives, my cousins. They, one day they came and said, why don't you come to our country? So I came and I stayed. You see how that's, that's how easy it was. Concerning this uh, uh, in innovation that my daughter, uh, daughter called them inventions, they're sort of innovations. Uh, when you have a puzzled mind, we have uh, a curiosity of something. And if you orient yourself in some direction, you can succeed if you're tenacious. Tenacity is important to be persistent. And the most important thing is, to learn from your mistakes. I have made so many mistakes, <laughs> it's incredible. But this is the most important thing, not to be successful from the start, but the process, the road you're taking to actually actual su success in the end. So this bike is the fastest with, with window. That bike is faster about seven to eight miles faster than this one because there is no window. There is no resistance. The window, you know, pushes you back. Yeah. So that's it's basically about aerodynamics and the bicycles. When I came in Toronto in 1972, I read uh, Popular Science and in California, somebody was doing very interesting things with these ideas. I said, I can, I can do that. I was dreaming to do that, why not? You know, in the old country over there where we were cycling ordinary bicycles and things like that, the dream was over there to do something, to improve something. So I started improving on the bicycles from the very, very beginning, young age. And the truth is I have never, I actually refuse to ride an ordinary bike. All the bikes that I ride, I build. <laughs> You can see me on the island riding my funny things, you know. Most people know. Uh, what else I can tell you about this, uh, this uh, particular me uh, mechanism? It takes, takes uh, not only engineering, but it takes a vision to do something so extraordinary that nobody have el uh, else had built. So you have sort of a dream, and you start fiddling with it, attempting, uh, trying, this is most likely the fourth or the fifth try, which I succeeded. And it's obviously, you know now, that it broke the world record. Thank to my engine. <laughs> <laughs> Relentless. He sits inside, he said, how do you breathe? People don't know because there is no openings. How do you breathe? But because of the disc wheels, when you start moving, they become fans, they start carrying air, and you can f feel the air behind your head passing by and going from the 
you have a cyclone inside. So he can last, it, he last a year, uh, uh, an hour riding on this thing and break the world record. Eight, he went, night, uh, how old? 92 kilometers for one hour. From here to Victoria for one hour on a bicycle. <laughs> So that's, but it's everything comes to the efficiency of the machine and the power and tenacity of the rider. Then a few years ago, uh, Sam suggested we put his, uh, his dear wife inside and she broke the world record for the woman. You know, his wife, Andrea, and my wife, Andrea, had, um, you know, they had the same name. And they, he and Gabriola, they, we had a very good relationship. Unfortunately, he did disappear. He is now on Quadra. But good, because he learned how to make bicycles. And now he's most likely the best bicycle builder after Marinoni, the famous Marinoni. Do, have you heard the, the man from Montreal? The whole world knows him. So now Sam Whittingham has a business producing an upright cycles, ordinary cycles, and he's world famous now with, not with this thing, but with his, you know, bicycle building. And, uh, and Daniel Wesley, he's world famous simply because he broke all the records with a hand power. He goes on, he said he went 30, uh, for the third, what was, 34 mile an hour? 31. 31 mile an hour. 31 miles now pedaling with, uh, with his arms. <laughs> people, people see this thing and there were cyclists there and he was going faster than the cyclists and sitting down with him pedaling on the, on the hand cycle. Meanwhile, there were people from Europe there. And so how come this Daniel Wesley is faster than most of the cyclists there? So decided, people from Holland and other places, they start buying my cycles. And as you know, in Holland, for example, is the center of the cycling in Europe. Everybody cycles there. They produce cycles, they do. And when they start, when these people start buying cycles from Gabriola, I said, ah so that's how I've been living for the last 35 years, selling uh, uh, cycles for people with disability in Holland and other places in Europe. Then the European Union put some restrictions now, so, and I'm, I'm too old now to brag about it. So I, I kind of make from time to time, but not always. So uh, I would like you to hear the voices of these two guys. They are better speakers than I am. Yeah, he, 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 he's going, this guy's again full of you know what. Okay, this is Sam Whittingham. He's talk a little bit to you about his experience with me, how torturous I was in the beginning. He came as a little teenager to me, quite obnoxious. I said, sit down. And then he figured it out like nobody else. George, George, you have <laughs> Oh, what a guy. I love you, George. Um, yeah, I'm sure we all do. Anyone who knows George, you can't help it. Um, it's really special to be here. Um, I lived here briefly for two years. Um, I grew up on Quadra Island, so a very similar island to this. Um, but uh, meeting George when I was an obnoxious teenager... <laughs> changed my life, it really did. Um, and I still, for better or for worse, I always think if I'm in a, if I'm in a tough, or I'm thinking about a tough problem, I go, what would, what would George do? And then I do the exact opposite. <laughs> <laughs> That's not true at all. Um, there's so many, I, it's, just, it's been a privilege to just find George at that time in my life and I was I was riding regular bicycles but I there was always a creative spirit in me where I thought there was more there was more there's more things there was more things to explore and play 
And um, when I met George, I went, oh my God, here's a guy, here's a guy who plays. He plays with everything. He's curious about everything. He thinks about the big problems. And I think the biggest thing that I, that I have learned and still try to carry this, of course, I get lost in the weeds like everyone else, but I think when you're, when you're looking at a, a problem or, a, or you're curious about something, rather than getting, uh, and, and George always calls it the tinkle tinkle, the jewelry, the distractions, the little things. It's like, no, 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 no. Think about the big problem. What's the, what's the big thing and tackle that and tackle it with curiosity and be willing to just fall on your face over and over and over again. And not worry about it because you're going to get there. You're going to get somewhere. You may not get there, wherever you thought there was when you started, but you're going to get somewhere. And um, I think I've approached that with everything I do now. And it's all, it's really is thanks to meeting George and being, I mean, we were, I like to say we were a team for 25 years. Um, we were a system, if you will. It's, uh, I mean, George would build the bikes and I would, the engine and would ride them. Um, and then I would try to help design them. And he would tell me I was full of, yeah. <laughs> and then do it the right way. <laughs> but no, it was that, it was that sense of play. And um, I carry that forward into building bicycles now and in all things. I just think, you know, what, what, what would George do? And uh, I love you for that. I think, I think about you all the time. And um, it's a real treat to be here. I, I mean, we stopped, we stopped racing, I don't even know. Was it five years ago, eight years ago? I'm not sure. Um, and, you know, we move on with other things and other projects and stuff. And to actually come back, and it's, it's so fun to go and look at the pictures and the old articles. And there's these beautiful... I mean, Janine and Stefan have put together this great thing in the, in the Gabriella Museum. Um, it's, 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 you know, I met, I met you as a teenager, and now I'm already looking back on the old days. You know, I'm now 51. How did we meet? Well, a very a mutual friend of ours named Paul Buttermer um, was already harassing George about about bicycles and what he, and uh, and was was helping a lot in their in the early days and at that time and George can correct me if I'm wrong but he was basically building the bicycles to fit him so he could try them and then trying to find other athletes to kind of shoehorn into shoehorn into them and I happen to be the right size it's really it's really the only the only thing that made me qualified to ride these bikes was that I was the right size um, and anyway, our mutual friend, Paul Buttermer, uh, saw me in a bike race. I was doing regular bike racing and said, hey, do you want to come try these crazy contraptions? Do you want to strap yourself inside a pod and hurdle your way down the road? Nothing could go wrong. <laughs> and I said, that sounds amazing. Yes, of course. And, uh, and that's, that's quite literally how it started. And in the early days, I mean, I mean, we eventually got to the point where we were breaking records and we got fairly well known and all this stuff, but the but for the first ten years, we were not. I mean, we we were making mistakes all over the place. We were going to races, but nobody knew who we were. We were figuring it out, but we were playing. We were having a great time and uh, watching what worked and what didn't, and where where things could be improved. And in the end, I think we started to teach everyone else, you know, possible ways of how to do things and. Uh, I can see now, it's, it's funny uh, when I watch the events and I watch other teams, um, I see so much of the influence of George's designs from 30 and 40 years ago, stuff that worked and they haven't been able to improve upon. And so, so many of those things have made it into the, the innovations that you see and I see it in all the hand cycles that are out there now, I see it in many of the bicycles. Um, even the work George now does in the sort of electric bicycle field, you see that, I mean, anyone who knows George, even for two minutes, knows how infectious his personality and his enthusiasm and his innovations are. You just, you just can't help but get wrapped up in all of that. And, uh, 
I've been getting wrapped up in it since 1989 or something. Yeah. Um, anyway, yes? What is it like to go fast? What is it like to go fast? What's the experience like? Yeah, this, this is the question that has been asked many times of me. Um, I'm not an adrenaline junkie, which sounds crazy. Um, but it was the feeling of efficiency and what it feels like. It's really loud. That's the number one thing. It's really loud. You're strapped in what is basically a speaker cabinet resonating the sound of the road. Um, as you can see, the bikes are really small, so only a couple of inches off the ground, hurtling your way down, peering through a little windshield. I can't, and it's so tailored to me, and we call it tailored. I don't say it's, I don't say that the bike is anything other than like wearing a tailored suit. So I can't move other than my legs. I can move my hands a little. Um, and so there's a real feeling that you and the bike are one thing and you're hurtling down the road. And yeah, I don't know how to explain it other than if you've ever, if you've ever been on any kind of vehicle where you've lost the brakes or you're slightly out of control, <laughs> it has that kind of, yeah, panicked feeling a bit. Uh, but there's a comfort in it too, knowing that it will end. Um, yeah. How do you stop? There are brakes in them, so like bicycle brakes. Uh, depending on where we are, it's, uh, it, normally when we did the speed records, you would, you, you would get up to speed over five or six or seven or miles, depending on the course. You were timed over 200 meters, and the whole course had to be dead flat. So, that's, and, uh, and then there's usually a slowdown area of a kilometer or a mile or so afterwards. Um, but that's a good, that, I mean, one good point there is that the whole, that all of this was about asking one big question, and that is how fast can a human being go? It's a really simple question. We've all, you know, it's like when you're a kid, you, you run as hard as you can and see how fast you can go. Um, and so that was, it was not about the adrenaline or about, about necessarily going fast or the feeling of going fast. It was just an, trying to answer that question. like. With only, with only your brain and your legs, how fast can you go? And with no gravity, nobody's pushing you, no engine, no wind. I mean, all of these things are restricted. You can't have any of that. So it's just a, it's just a really simple question. How fast can a human being go? Um, and, and I think George and I just shared, and I'm sure Daniel too, that answering that question, like, well, with the, with the minimal tools we've got, what can you do? Um, I don't know if that answers. I think I meandered. <laughs> yeah. Oh yes. Did we crash them? We sure did. Um, well, every crash is different. Uh, some are easy and no problem. Some were terrifying and horrific. Um, amazingly. I never got hurt um, in 20 years of doing this and some pretty big crashes, never really got more than a bit of a scrape and a bruise. Um, and that's a testament to, I mean, George, I mean, to get, when we would do these attempts, I mean, one of the things that is still, still I, I always have this vision is like, whatever it was, whether we were doing a speed record attempt or a one hour endurance event, or I mean, Paul Buttermer who used to ride with George used to do 24 hour events and stuff like this. But the one thing we always knew at the very end is that somebody had to catch you because we're taped into these things. I can't get out on my own. So you had to finish whatever you were doing and then come in and get caught. And for 25 years, after every event, whatever I was trying to do, whether it went well, whether it went badly, whether we set a world record, basically, no matter what had happened, I knew that at the very end, what I was gonna see was George doing this. <laughs> With a very big, worried smile on his face. Wondering how it went, how I was doing, and where, was I gonna stop in time before I ran him over? And sometimes I ran him over. Um, I, yeah, I meandered again, didn't I? Um, crashing, yeah. Had a couple of big crashes, but again, nothing. 
I think, ter terrific in the end. Yeah. Well, he was scared of crap out of him in the last one. Yeah. He, um, he took off and he flew about 200 yards over the South Pacific. Why am far away from them? Why am far away? What's happening? Why so quiet? He was flying <laughs> sideways and then poof. Well, that's happened when you are 80 miles an hour because this is a wing and it wants to fly <laughs> <laughs> until it crashes down to the... Anyway. I mean, w one of the good points is it actually felt very safe in this vehicle because one of the things that makes it so fast is one of the things that makes it so safe as well. The, it, it, the very slippery shape and nature of it means that even when it's sideways, even when it's rolling, um, there's not a lot to get caught either on the ground or caught by the air. It just tends to keep going. And as long as there's not something to actually physically run into, and we were pretty adamant. There were some courses where we, we would feel it was unsafe and we would ask them to remove you know, posts on the side of the highway or whatever it was, because if you hit that, obviously that's a whole different game. Um, but the truth is, if you don't hit anything, it can just kind of slide and do what it does through the air, and it's kind of slippery. I'm going to hand this over to Daniel, okay. and I, I'm, I'm very curious to hear some things from you. I haven't seen Daniel in... 10, 15 years or something like that. So this is, it's a really cool reunion for us. And I'm, yeah, Daniel. Thanks. Thanks, Sam. Thank you, George. And thank you, everybody, for being here today. Nice that the weather's cooperating. Now, um, you know, I, I think i got to give a bit of background about myself just to let you know where I came from and how I, I got involved with George and then I'll explain a little bit about the equipment that we uh, went through. Um, my, uh, I, I was out with some friends in 1973 when I was 13 and they wanted to go and jump on a moving freight train and I had a funny feeling in my stomach that that wasn't a good idea. But I didn't listen to it. And uh, fell under the train. The same weekend that I, that happened to me, I, um, Rick Hansen, was in the back of a pickup truck and the truck went off the road and he got hit with the toolbox. And we both landed in the hospital in uh, New Westminster in Royal Columbian Hospital. And uh, even back then, we were having fun racing, racing our wheelchairs down the hallways. He's uh, two years older than me, so he would get a little bit of a lead on me. And I don't know if you re remember some of those hallways in the basements of some of these hospitals have these huge magnetic doors and he would just pop the doors like this as we were going through and these wheelchairs that we were racing back then they were dinosaurs big chrome steel folding things with footrests that I didn't need too much of and they would knock those doors right back open anyway I went my way, Rick went his, and I got involved in some disabled sports back then, played some basketball um, with Rick and Terry. And, um, but, uh, you know, I always wanted to do a little bit of racing, wheelchair racing. And um, the wheelchairs that we had, you know, like I said, they were just the fold up type, and that's what we started on. And, um, and then before too long, I came up with this idea that I needed to get a custom chair built. So I thought, well, where do you go? And who's building something right now that looks like it would work for me? And I lived in Surrey at the time. And there was a place that was building sulkies. Do you guys know what a sulky is? They drag behind horses and they race these things. And I thought, well, geez, you know, they could make a, a really small one with just four wheels and it would be perfect. And it was. And so I started racing that. And before too long, I started making some uh, pretty good progress with my wheelchair racing. And then by chance, one of the other guys that I was racing with, he mentioned to me that uh, there, he lived in Nanaimo. His name's Doug White. And uh, he says he knows this guy, George, and I should come over and meet him because he's building these things called hand cycles. And uh, you know, when you're in a wheelchair, 
you're in a wheelchair. <laughs> Not much goes on in a wheelchair. I mean, you go slow, you know, if there's this kind of gravel right here, you're going slower. You know, if there's a bit of an incline, oh, and that's not good either. And if it's a downhill, well, geez, that's not good either. Um, so um, George was building these really neat hand cycles, and I thought, holy smokes, that thing is going to give me wings. It's going to set me free. So, you know, I ended up getting one of those, and, uh, and then we started racing it, and then... Um, you know, then, you know, I mentioned to him that, you know, I, I probably want to still race the wheelchair some and, and maybe he could help me design one. And we built maybe two or three in total. Um, I remember the first one that he built me, uh, I had to go and race in London, England. And the year before I raced there and won, I was racing with all these guys and they were crafty guys. You know, they were like, sneaky guys really they would stay in your draft and and then they would pull out and pass in the last minute or two oh that wasn't playing fair to me so anyway the next year i come by with this uh, new chair that george made me and um and the same thing was happening they had the world champion there named heinz fry they had the best guys from england and and the rest of uh switzerland and germany and um and i found myself in the front of the pack quite a bit of the time and i and i realized that these guys are just going to use me up again like they did last year so i had to i had to come up with a plan quickly so what i did was i turned to this one guy who was a sweetheart of a fella um dave and I says, Dave, you know what you're going to do is I'm going to let you win. I'm going to hold Heinz Fry back. I'm just going to pretend I'm tired, dog tired, and you just go. So with about two miles remaining, he just went and kept going and going. And I kept looking like I was dog tired. And, and sure enough, at the last minute, Heinz Fry pulls out and goes around me. So I tucked into his draft. Now, when you race a wheelchair, there's not much, um, like you can't say, oh, I'm going to be the fastest or I'm going to do, you know, this or that. Um, but what you can do is you can break it down into little areas. So what I did was I told myself I'm going to be really good at climbing hills and really good at doing a right-hand turn. And that's what happens at the end of that race. At the end of that race, you can turn right and you go up the bridge, up the uh I guess it's the clock tower bridge, the London bridge, finishes on the top of the bridge. And uh, so, fast into the corner, fast up the hill, and I couldn't believe it, I came in first. And that is thanks to George and his, his, his development of that wheelchair of mine. Um, now, uh, I, um, you know, I, uh, I wanted to do more than just race the wheelchair too. So I was at the same time I was playing basketball and and uh, and then I in '92 I had a bit of an injury playing floor hockey. So I, I took a different direction and I decided to get involved in wheelchair tennis and alpine skiing. <laughs> alpine skiing is like you think you're you're getting wings to fly by being on a bike. Try a pair of skis going down a hill. That is freedom. So, um, so George and it helped me build a few different versions of this. And the, the, the second one that we built, um, I, I just thought, you know, because he, he's, a, he's a good collaborator, and uh, I thought, well, what we'll do is maybe we'll just use a leaf spring out of a car. Well, that wasn't really a good idea, because... <laughs> going, uh, going like this. I was more in the air going down the hill than on the ground. Anyway, that was um, M2. So then we went on to our M3. And, uh, and what also happens with uh, disabled skiing is that they have these different categories. Um, there's, there's three major categories. There's those that have no abdominals from a spinal cord injury. Those that have them and then the rest, that makes sense. I'm in the rest group. 
So um, I, what I would do is I would give a certain percentage of time to those other two groups. Say, well, it would be based on the data capture. So every year they, they would look at the numbers and they'd see how far ahead the guys with the rest were than the others. And they would kind of compare the times and do some mathematical thing on it, which in the end it was very suspect. And I would have to, like, say, let me just give you an example here. There was this one race in Colorado. The world championships were down there. And um, I knew if I came around this one corner and, and played it right, I, I wouldn't be landing for a very, very long time. I'd just be flying down the hill like that. And, um, but I was confident in the equipment that we had built. And... Um, and I was 23 seconds ahead of the next guy. So what that meant was I had to, next year, I had to give them 23 seconds. And I had to be that much faster than them just to come in one second ahead. Now, um, so then we had to build M4. And, uh, and then we started, we started getting really kind of creative there. And, um, and we used weight to our advantage. We used a, a big steel block in the bottom of it so it would just carry the speed in the flats. And um, so I was able to um, go to five different Paralympic Games, two summer and three in the winter. And the winter games um, in uh, Salt Lake City was my last one. And then uh, Nagano was second to last. And then um, Lilyhammer was my first Winter Games. Um, and, I, and I was so fortunate to be able to represent the country. Now, every time that I went into an event and competed, I, I, I felt like I wasn't for myself that I was doing this. I was doing this to show people what Canada is made of. They thought that if I had a very selfless pursuit, then it would actually make me even faster. And that's kind of how George and his development of his equipment has come about. You know, he, he had a vision to, to be, to make people's needs, you know, to meet their needs. And, um, and it's through his selfless commitment and, um, you know, his, I guess it's really kind of fortunate that we get all involved um, with him. Um, I, I don't know how that is. It's like, um, like destiny that, that you find somebody that uh, can fill that gap. Um, because, because in wheelchair racing or, or in disabled sports in general, there's not much money in it. Actually, there's very little. And so you don't have much money to, to buy the equipment unless you've got these huge sponsors and you know how to do that. I never did. Um, and so there, there was George. He was providing these uh, incredible bits of equipment and, uh, and, he, and he was putting Canada on the map. And I, I'm very proud to have been part of, that, part of that history. So thank you. Thank you guys. I would like to take a moment before we show some of the videos on the screen to open up the floor for all of you to ask George some questions because I think he has a lot more to share. Go for it, Timmy. There, there was a big price. $40,000 for making a helicopter, human power helicopter, to lift 10 feet off the ground and to stay there for one minute. And me being Bulgarian, <laughs> not knowing much about anything, I thought so. I'm going to build a helicopter. So I built a helicopter. It took me a month and a half, and I put the helicopter, and Sam was pedaling it. Sam was young and uh, very anxious. He was excited about flying, too. 
So we built helicopter, we put it in our um, park there between the two trees. We hang the, the helicopter on the high up with the measuring uh, thing to see how much lift we create. So I built a helicopter, you can see it in the pictures there, but never flew. <laughs> Because the guy wasn't strong enough. To... <laughs> no, no, it was. Then I read, I read an article next uh, uh, in the in the magazine that is um, uh, a flying magazine, you know, po popular magazine that talks about flying airplanes, things like that. And the article that described the helicopter the first month, I built it. The second man, the, art, the, the other engineer comes and writes another article that this guy that wrote that article is foolish. You know what? And he said, the wings have to be twice as big. And really, my wings weren't big enough. I made what? And, but it's a beautiful helicopter. All the brilliant people can come and I'll show you. The wings are beautiful. I fly them like that. You know, and they lift. Like they glide, it's an incredible thing to see how, after how the wind is affecting the wing. We all think about how the goddamn airplane flies. The wing, the wing start moving and one will go up and up and up. We don't know yet why, but it does. And my wings are still um, plastered against the wall there, they're beautiful. So uh, that's how I build a helicopter, and then I build other things, and then I build the cycles for people all over the world, and that's how I make my living. So what else you want me to ask you? Well, Rick Hansen, I was down at the, at the Granville, Granville Market on, in, um, in Vancouver, riding my recumbent bikes. By the way, I'll show you, I was the first fellow from Europe that introduced recumbent bicycle riding in this country. And I started making recumbent bicycles. So Rick Hansen saw me down there and, has, uh, and asked the other fellow, who is this guy? He said, this is George. Come here, George. Can you build me a wheelchair? I said, yes. So I built two or three contraptions, you know. And that's how we became very good friends. He came here and, uh, and all sorts of things. By the way, Howard called me for two years. I don't know what's happening with him these days, but uh, um, uh, very good relationship with Rick Hansen because he was a fellow so courageous on wheelchair, daring to go around the world. He went, he went across China and all sorts of other places, uh, you know. So he's uh, basically, he's a good, uh, good fellow and good friend of mine. But um, uh, with hand cycles and other things, uh, uh, through him and, and Daniel, we introduced it to the world. And I even have a way of joking and saying, you know, since Holland is the uh, center of the cyclist, I am like selling frigidaires to Eskimos. <laughs> <laughs> selling bicycles to Dutch people is something, you know, from Gabriel. But yes, that's, that's how I, my family survived on the basis of that, that they made hand cycles for people from Holland, Germany, and Switzerland. That was originally uh, a big uh, splash because nobody was making them. Then people got smart in Holland. They went to China and started mass producing the same product. And uh, they ran me out of, <laughs> out of town. <laughs> so I, you know, I, uh, it wasn't very good after that, put it that way. Uh, what, what is the other question you say? Papa, can you tell them how you build the fast bike? How do I build this yeah. thing? Yeah, because you said you're not an engineer, so how do you build the fast bike? Well, no, but, but uh, not an engineer, doesn't mean... See, I professionally, you know, I, as a young man, I was interested in Michelangelo, in sculpt, and I become a sculptor. I went to uh, the school, five years, Academy of Art, and I become sculptor. And I start sculpting and making um, uh, statues. In Toronto, for example, I have quite a few uh, monuments here and there and other statues. Uh, um, and, and then um, uh, it was difficult in Canada to survive as a sculptor. And when I came to Gabriel, I said, I'm going to start making something else later. And so that's how I start making uh, 
bicycles and tricycles for disabled people, and now I'm making bicycles for you and me, all farts. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like this thing. You know, but it's very good to go. Nobody have taken care for older people. You know, many years ago I said, why we have these cycles, bicycles that we ride, and when you're old and you fall and you break yourself, silly. So then I have a even patent. In the late 70s, I designed a bicycle. It's called Step Through. You don't have a friend. They're all over now. And after seven years, my patent expired. I cannot do anything. I couldn't do anything with it. But anyway, the, the Step Through cycles that everybody writes now originated here in Toronto, actually, when I was. They gave me the patent. I talked to all the companies that are producing sites. No, we are not interested in anything. We were producing only mountain bikes. So that's how the whole thing ended up. I produced 25 uh, step-through bikes here when I came to Gabriola. They immediately were sold initially, or initially when we came, and we start making a living by making bicycles. She and Andrea, my wife, my beautiful wife, she controlled and she knew everything, what is needed. She was literate at computers and other things, not like me, and she helped to sustain the, the contact with, with the world. We have a cycles, even in Alaska, in Russia, in, uh, in um, New Zealand, and everywhere. You know, I just sent one double in the, the most remote place in Australia. Husband and wife. She is disabled, he is able bodied. So she sits in the cycles uh, with her hands and he's in the front cycling a, like a bicycle. So it's a, it's a very good uh, way of putting two people together and you know, to enjoy their life, put it that way. <laughs> Joanne wants to know how you get in. Well, how can you get You open it. It, the, 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 you, know, you open the, the, the white part lifts up, you sit inside, the, you know, and uh, yeah, this is, this is. Yeah, do you want to take it off, Sam? Do you want to show them how it rides? <laughs> I'm not going to ride. <laughs> but yeah, basically, I don't know how many you can see, but so this is what's inside. Can I show them to her? No taking pictures? Yeah. How heavy is that? I'm going to copy it. But really, there's not much in here. I mean, there's the seat. Tell me about the headrest. Yeah, the headrest. Uh, we went through a lot of rigorous product testing <laughs> <laughs> to figure out that a car wash sponge was the best. <laughs> Better than a leaf spring. <laughs> The question is, how, how much faster do we think human beings can go? And um, I have no idea. Yeah. Um, but that's the fun part, is that I don't know. I don't even want to ask. I don't want. I, I no longer want to ask the question. <laughs> um, uh, it is a good one, though. And there are, there are hopefully, I mean, George and I, you know, we're waiting for people to come and, and ask that question now. Um, it is, does seem to be going up in smaller and smaller increments now. So until there's some massive change, probably in tire technology, I would think at this point, um, we're not going to see a whole lot of increase for a while. I, but I don't know. Let's do that. But can we give it up for George, Sam, and Daniel? Thank you so much for coming. And please take a goodie bag on your way out on the table.